I'm Victoria Durr, lecturer in arts management and cultural policy in the School of Creative Arts at Queen's. And I and my two co-researchers, Rosalind Lowry, arts development officer with Mid and East Antrim Borough Council, and Kevin Murphy, CEO of Voluntary Arts Ireland, would like to thank everyone for having us here today. Um, while I'll be giving the presentation in the spirit of our, our co-produced research, uh, Kevin and Rosalind will be here for any questions and discussion afterwards. Um, our intention today is to share some insights into what is still an ongoing research project. Specifically, we'll be talking about our analysis of the Creative Citizens program. Creative Citizens is a public uh, facing festival-like program that originated in Balamina and it expanded to Mid and East Antrim Borough Council once the amalgamation in local government took place. And we're going to be exploring what that program has taught us about involving citizens in local arts development and how that might apply within the new context of government reform, specifically thinking about uh, the community planning process. So I try and see if this works. Yes, great. Um, I'm going to begin by presenting the wider context of our study, particularly the government reform with a focus on issues of arts and cultural policy making and practice. I'll then go into the, the case study itself and what we've looked at. And I'm going to highlight key areas of learning and insight we've discovered so far. While I'll be looking specifically at the community planning process, um, in terms of learning, we're hoping that there'll be a chance to discuss some of the broader areas relevant in kind of executive level government reform and in light of the Cal Committee's recent uh, completion of their inquiry on the inclusion in the arts of working classes that was referred to earlier. And then I'll have some concluding remarks. So our study's context is one where, as we know, uh, Northern Irish government is in the midst of substantial government reform. And of particular relevance to the arts and culture are the consolidation of 12 ministerial departments into nine, with DECAL becoming part of a department for communities. There's been a push for cross-cutting uh, cross executive arts and cultural strategy that was recently out for consultation new powers to local government, and then a wider impact of state budget cuts to the arts. And these changes provide new scope for practitioners and policymakers in the arts and culture at executive and local level to develop greater understanding of the cultural rights, interests, and activities of citizens. And wider research uh, that is referred to more specifically in the policy briefing shows that um, this understanding is, is quite critical to the executive's ambition to build a vibrant, healthy, prosperous, safe, and sustainable community. Uh, communities, goals at the heart of community planning and uh, within the broader program for government. Key government work over the last few years, such as that listed here, indicates that there's a recognition of the value of the arts and culture, but they also make apparent some of the challenges facing how we might build awareness of citizens' rights, interests, and kind of engagement in arts, creativity, and culture. I'm going to highlight four challenges now. First, these documents indicate a lack of understanding of the public value of arts and cultural participation. They demonstrate the ways in which uh, how we understand value of arts, creativity, and culture as being largely attached in a positive way to strategic government priorities and policy goals like economic development, tourism, social cohesion, and health and well-being. And we're not meaning to imply any disagreement with these correlations. There's lots of studies that do show there is correlation there. We do think that this finding or this, uh, this approach is, is limited. And that limitation is largely based on an, a vague way in which we're defining arts and cultural participation within policy and practice. So uh, for example, DECAL's strategy for culture and arts, uh, which was recently out for consultation, as I mentioned, it begins by seeking responses on how individuals and organizations interpret art and culture themselves. And they acknowledge that arts and culture mean many things to many people, and there's no single definition. Yet despite acknowledging there's a wide variety of interpretations and then a lack of clarity for policy, the research is able, DECAL research has, has concluded that a significant number of citizens aren't engaging 
in arts and culture. So um, what we begin to see is our third challenge. This issue of value and definition is based on the way in which we're measuring arts and, and uh, arts and cultural participation. The mechanisms that we're using to collect and analyze data on arts and cultural participation mean that policymakers and practitioners are typically interpreting it as a return on investment based on one's tendency to take part in publicly funded art and culture. So that means that the main justification for participation is based on a market-driven approach. It's reinforcing the idea that making or taking part is rooted in an economic agenda, tackling poverty, promoting tourism, hiring venues and the spend on that, uh, that the money that returns on that, purchasing of tickets that can then deliver on a social agenda, which is health and well-being, social inclusion, uh, reconciliation, this kind of thing. So what results are policies and practices where those who aren't engaging in publicly funded arts and culture are seen to be at some sort of deficit. Why aren't they engaging and we have to fix what's wrong with them um, crops up. And this issue of how we're measuring and understanding participation came up in the Cal Committee report where it was acknowledged that capturing data on non-ticketed um, so you know, there's no box office information about who went to something. Uh, Non-venue based and voluntary and amateur arts activity um, means that we're not sure what the return on investment is. Um, and this then limits our, our understanding of how arts and culture is, is defined by citizens themselves and how we might value that. We're, we're risking kind of um, seeing a diversity of practice beyond that which is kind of easy to, to capture information about. And these challenges of, of data capturing, evidence making, which are linked to kind of accountability for public spend of money, plays out in practice and it restricts more democratic approaches to how we might understand and nurture the cultural uh, life of our communities. And they reinforce what in the arts and cultural sector is, uh, is a long-standing culture of elitiz elitism there itself, where there's a kind of unhelpful hierarchy in the sector where the professional arts are seen as separate from the commercial arts and separate from arts and education, separate from community arts, separate from voluntary uh, and amateur arts activity, rather than seeing this as a kind of collective cultural ecosystem that is integrated and interconnected and interdependent. So what I'm gonna do now is turn to the case study of Creative Citizens to explore what we found out about potential ways for addressing some of these issues at local level. So uh, Creative Citizens, um, why, as this public-facing festival-like program, it be, it, the planning for it begins in September of the previous year, with March to June uh, being kind of the main public-facing program. Um, it was coordinated in, the, in 2014, its first year, by the then Balamina Arts and Development Service. And as a result, it focused solely on the, the borough of Balamina, while the 2015 program um, was launched just shortly after the amalgamation into Mid and East Antrim uh, Borough. In 2014, Creative Citizens took a different approach to the previous festivals that were run uh, by, by Balamina's uh, Arts and Development Service. So where previously the program uh, was the local authority arts office uh, kind of putting on a professional arts program for people to attend, Creative Citizens started with the question, what are you doing that's creative? People were invited to respond and submit events to be programmed and, and promoted in what became known as, as Creative Citizens. And here on the slide is, is an array of some of the activity, just a sample really of some of the activity that took place. In addition to people putting forward their own activities, uh, like things happening in restaurants and uh, with the Inter-Ethnic Forum, there was a mixture of professional and non-professional arts melding in the program where uh, architects, artists, and citizens came together with public servants to discuss um, 
uh, what a cultural walking map of their town center might look like, where professional harpists performed in barber shops as pictured here. So uh, each year also saw the complementary programming of, of kind of one major professional artistic feature devised um, and it kind of initiated by the local authority art service. 2014 saw Donna Cajal take uh, this round sculpture pictured here in the video that he's made and put it in unusual uh, or non-traditional art spaces out in the borough. Um, so here you see this man coming across it on a golf course, wondering what that's all about. Um, and as the video progresses, you see it um, outside a school ground um, and you know, in public car parks and in town center spaces. A highlight of the 2015 program was the inclusion of the Methodist Arts Collection of Modern Paintings of Christian Art. Owned by the Methodist Church in Britain, the collection was exhibited at the Braid Art Center, but in addition, nine local churches and the Ballymena Interchurch Forum also displayed one painting each. And in doing so, they devised and developed their own public program for people to come into the church. So there were talks around the paintings and different activities as pictured here that were promoted individually by the different churches. The churches also played a really important role in the 2015 program in helping to establish an arts ambassadors program, which saw 126 uh, people uh, volunteer who had little or uh, no previous kind of arts and arts experience to be invigilators to kind of monitor and sit in and talk to people in the exhibition space of the braid at the time. So there were a number of partners that took place, and there's further information on this in, in the policy briefing. Um, important possibly to note here is there was a five-fold increase in the number of events over a three-fold increase in the number of participants between the 2013 more curated program and the 2014 kind of more engaged, citizen-engaged program. And that's despite a 40% reduction in spending over the same period. So in terms of the research, uh, we approach Creative Citizens as an action research project, which has allowed us for an ongoing and flexible applied research process where we kind of respond and uh, reflect and analyze what's happening and kind of do something as a result of that and continue to ask questions. But of major uh, importance is, has been our co-produced process. So the three of us have been working together to devise the research questions, to collect the data, and to analyze the data together. And what this has allowed us is a space where we each value equally each other, one another's kind of uh, field of knowledge, so uh, coming from academia or local government, public servant, uh, arts development agency perspective, we each bring some kind of different lens to the perspective. And in doing so, we've uh, looked at different literature evaluation reports, academic literature, interviewed uh, participants, observed um, activities and creative citizens, um, and also it, it, the research reflects kind of wider interviews with other local authority arts offices as well. So what I'm gonna do now is turn to the four lessons that uh, we, we've gleaned uh, that we're gonna to share today and, and there's more again in the, in the document. So for community planning, community planning includes processes that attempt to bring decision making closer to citizens and communities. And Creative Citizens has two things that help facilitate the opportunity for that to happen. First is, a, is perhaps an obvious one in the sense that it's a tangible idea and an output for people to work together on. So there's a public event with programs 2014 and 15 that get produced, people come together and work on it, something is achieved, they saw it happen, and it was realized. So it's something for people to work together around. Second, it's facilitated a range of personal, organizational, and community motivations to be realized in real time. And part of the reason that this was possible was the nature of the local authority staff asking the question that they did, 
What are you doing that's creative? It began with a personalized invitation from public servant to citizen. And in starting with questions about what, what we have rather than what we feel we lack or we need, we can begin, uh, we, we're promoting positive rather than a negative value of our local community assets. But we're still extending awareness of what's needed. So um, this arts ambassador talks about the fact that you were asked initially to take part meant that someone thought you could do the job. So the sense of kind of positive value um, participants felt there was an, uh, the assumption that there was a need to be developed or transformed in some way wasn't there, that they, you know, I have something to bring to the table here. Um, there was no pressure as well for individuals to, to do certain things. They could, they could take part in a way that suited uh, them, their interests, their, and their own kind of needs and motivations. So creating the pathways for citizens to opt in at their own, at their own level, um, kind of, you know, with no pressure whatsoever, allows people to have different intensities of commitment to participation that will change over time, depending. So um, people who took part perceived that there was a mutual value in doing so. So I have a value in taking part and I see the value that it brings to you as well. So this local business employee talks about how it made sense if you know, both organizations want to bring uh, people into the town center, it makes sense to work together. There's a mutual value, a mutual return kind of for our goals here. Um, whereas at Arts Ambassador, I was getting so much back too on a personal level. This uh, individual realizes what the Arts Ambassador program brought to, say, the local authority or the braid, but also what it brought to themselves. But additionally, the local authority art staff that participated in the study um, got a fresh start, as they called it, in terms of their programming and development. So they, they new lines of thinking, new ways of approaching the work that they were doing. So there was a mutual exchange and mutual advantage here. Um, community planning aims to facilitate greater integration of local services at, lo at local level services and awareness of existing networks, infrastructure, partnerships, and how they are working and might work together are critical to this. In challenging um, th this kind of hierarchical, this unhelpful hierarchy I referred to earlier in the arts, um, and opening up the interpretation by saying, what are you doing that's creative? Uh, the program has been able to shed light on a wider variety of cultural assets in the community. Um, including, and, th and that's, we've seen that to include ideas, knowledge, in, uh, physical infrastructure as well. So for example, the church connection is referenced in this quote, was, was a venue for arts exhibition, but it was also a network of familiarity for people to engage in the Creative Citizens program. Someone invited me from my church and then I expanded out from there. In addition, what, it, what it's allowed is, as this local councillor talks about in terms of the 2014 program, was it uncovered groups and activities involved in the arts not before known, not previously known about in a place that was seen as not a natural arts place. So our understanding of creative, uh, creative cultural and artistic engagement extends then beyond the traditional publicly funded model. Um, to include more localized everyday aspects. But what's really interesting about Creative Citizens is um, that may not be so new and exciting, but what Creative Citizens has allowed us to do is a new mechanism for seeing the relationship of these seemingly opposed arenas to each other and how kind of integrated and interconnected they are. So we get a better picture of our community's cultural ecosystem as I, ref as I was referring to earlier and the sense of place that's so important to the community planning process. And finally, we just want to kind of uh, make, put out there that to create a stronger and more effective local democracy as the community planning process is aimed at, Local authority structures need to be open to participatory knowledge exchange. It's not a one-way process, but a multiple-way process. Um, so it needs to be flexible. Structures have to be flexible, adaptable. They have to allow for time. 
So um, this is allowed within the program itself. We see this in terms of um, getting out of a, an old mindset that I have to program a, a 400 seat venue, um, looking out into the community about what the community might do with that physical infrastructure in which we've invested. Um, but with that distribution of power and expertise will likely shift. So in some instances, the expertise will be coming from one direction where the local authority is you know, providing marketing expertise or knowledge, providing space, funding, uh, connecting people. But in other ways as well, local authority staff will be brought uh, learning. So this, this one refers to uh, being stuck in the office all the time, you don't see the bigger picture. So going out and actually finding out what people are interested in is a very valuable learning experience in and of itself. So in conclusion, in order to address the kind of broader program for government and, and community planning issues, fostering vibrant, healthy, prosperous, safe, and sustainable communities requires a rethinking of the relationship between public servants and citizens, redefining what is understood as culture, arts, cre and creativity within our policy, and reimagining our perception of local infrastructure as cultural. And while more research on creative citizens is needed to kind of fully understand the range, reach, and process involved in the program, we feel that though what we have found so far is um, it's, it's matching what's what similar activity in England and Scotland referred to in the policy briefing paper. But it demonstrates possible methods for participatory engagement between public servants and citizens, approaches for understanding citizens' needs and interests, capacity building within local authorities when they work with citizens, and the potential uh, for valuing the, cult the fuller cultural life of our communities, in particular the relevance of arts and creative uh, activity to their everyday lives. We're going to be continuing to embed action research into Creative Citizens moving forward. It's continuing in, in this year. And we're really open to exchanging ideas and um, research with anyone in local authority or in the arts, cultural sector, or c citizens here. So thank you very much.